Let's all stand and pray together. Holy God, set apart this time now, we ask you. Set apart this time, make it holy. Father, we ask that you pour out your Spirit afresh upon us now. Open our hearts and minds to the reading and to the proclaiming of your word. Father, let your truth settle deep within our hearts. And there may it bear much fruit. We ask that we never, ever leave your word unchanged. We offer all this up in the strong, powerful, and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It's wonderful to be here today because I enjoy the Advent season. I enjoy the traditions. I enjoy all the symbols. Um, like this one, for instance. This is one of my favorites, the Advent wreath with the candles. I mean, there's a lot in there to teach us. We have the, you know, we have the greens and the light representing the life and, and light of Christ. They go out into a dark and dying world. But I also think these symbols have some practical uses as well, or I've come to believe that over time. You see, we light these things and leave them going the whole time, and we set them up front by the preacher when he's speaking, and they slowly burn down, all the way down to the greens. And I think that's so that when I'm up here talking and there's suddenly a big eruption of flame... I know that I've gone too long, right? <laughs> but see, I don't have to worry about that because you all, you all didn't chintz. So you've got the big candles here. <laughs> so I can just go on and on all day, right? You look worried. Uh, it's, it's okay. I won't, I won't do it. Oh, you did. He looked at, you know, looking a little worried there. There's no problem with that. I mean, because, uh, because the king was worried too. See, 2,700 years ago, there was a king that was very, very worried. His country was divided in half at the time. The king's name was Ahaz. He was king over Jerusalem. And the northern half, well, they'd been going downhill for years. But they retained the name of Israel. But lately, there'd been a couple warlords rise up. And he'd heard some rumors. See, they were going to travel south and come knocking at his door. Uh, in fact, they were going to knock a hole in Jerusalem's walls, come in, take all his stuff, and probably, you know, he wasn't going to end up too well at the end of the day. So Ahaz calls all of his advisors together. He calls them all together because he's troubled and he wants some advice. And so picture him there in his throne room, and he's got all the eggheads with him. And he says, okay, what do we do? we got these guys up north, they're going to come after us, what do we do? And I'm sure someone says, hey, we need to go to Egypt, yeah, but they're too far south. Someone says, Moab or Ammon, you know, but I mean, honestly, those guys, nah, they hate Ahaz too, why would they help him? And then, as they're sitting there, stroking their beards and, and thinking, one of them says, I got an idea. You know, we got this temple here, and we're awfully wealthy. So how about we just send a bunch of money way up north? There's this empire that's rising, Assyria. And they are known for being, well, meanie heads. I, I think that's the original Hebrew, but you, you get the idea. They're known for being extremely cruel says, why don't we bribe them? Because we know they're going to come south sooner or later. We'll just bribe them to kill off those guys and then stop there and not come after us. You know, that sounds like a good idea. But then the prophet of the Lord, Isaiah, steps forward. And he says, no, this is what God says. God says, trust me. 
Don't go to foreign powers. Don't do any of that stuff. Just, just trust me and forget about those guys. I got it taken care of so long as you trust me. Now that's the paraphrased version as well. But Ahaz instead turns back to his advisors and says, tell me more about this idea you have about a bribe. So now you have the picture of Isaiah leaving and you can see how disappointed he is in his leaders. Because Ahaz is not a godly king. He's not going to obey. Isaiah can see the writing on the wall. It's not going to turn out good. But it's at that moment in time, that moment, when God gives to him a prophecy. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. If you open your Bibles and turn there with me, I think we can have it on the screen as well. Isaiah chapter 11. It's a prophecy in two parts. The first part talks of another king, a future king. It says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. This is a different kind of king. The Spirit of God Almighty rests upon this person. Indeed, in this person, he's always going to know the right thing, always going to do the right thing, always going to choose the right thing, and his discernment is unmatched. That means that even in those gray areas in life, there's times you're not quite sure what to do, what is the God-honoring thing to do, what's the right thing to do, this guy will know. But it also means that even in those times when there are several good decisions out there, you know, they're all good, but which one do you pick? He's going to know the best one. What's more, he's going to be accessible. So when you take something to him, he's going to be willing to impart that knowledge to you. It's a different kind of king. Don't get me wrong, though. He is a true king, and he does have authority. He will judge and speak into situations, but he doesn't judge by appearances and he won't be swayed by sweet talk. No, like God, he looks straight at the heart at your motivation, your desire, your attitude. He's not a uh, cold-hearted judge. He's not one of those detached sort of just the facts, ma'am, sort of judge. No, he's kind. He's kind and he does the right thing. And he stands up for those who cannot help themselves and looks with favor upon those who trust God and who humbly serve God, those who live upright before God. You know, I would love a leader like that, wouldn't you? I mean, that would be awesome. I would love that kind of king and that kind of kingdom. And this passage is seen as a prophecy, a prophecy of the Messiah, whom we know as Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord. It's talking about Him. And we know that He came to heal this great gap between God and man, for He is the Prince of Peace. And you see, someone needed to bring some peace because we are forever separated from God because of all the things that we have done wrong. And just to check that, we can just look back at some of God's law. You know, those Ten Commandments, those pesky little things that, they, that always seem to come up 
in the news every now and then. You can go down the list. Have you ever put anything in your heart? Any cause, any other person, or even yourself, above the Almighty God, the One who created you, the One who loves you most, the One who has the best plans for you? Have you ever lied? Have you ever cut someone's character down, slandered them behind their back? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever been obsessed with something that's not yours? That's coveting. And what it means is that you put something in your heart over and above God. God's always looking at the heart. Which is exactly why Jesus could say, Lust, it's the same as adultery because your heart's already there. He could say, hate, same as murder, because your heart's already there. You see, there's a big gap between us and God. But Jesus Christ came to heal that gap. And when we believe in Him, follow Him, have a change of heart and mind about God, and let it apply to our lives, then we become his child, children in his kingdom, a kingdom that's spoken of in the next five verses. It says, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion, the yearling together, and a little child will lead them, the cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. It's describing the kingdom of heaven. Now the Jews at the time of Christ, they were under the thumb of the Roman Empire. And so they figured, if anybody's going to bring a kingdom like that on earth, well, he's obviously got to have a bigger sword than the Romans, right? I mean, that's logical. So they were looking for a military messiah. Basically, the cliff note version is, they were looking for Rambo, and they got Jesus. And that's why many of them missed him. You understand? They had the wrong expectations of the king. Now, if you are a disciple of Christ, if you follow him, and you've recognized the king, but um, what I'm afraid of is that sometimes we miss his kingdom. We miss what His kingdom is supposed to be and what it's all about. We miss it because of our expectations. You see, Jesus said to Pilate, My kingdom, it's not of this world. We expect everything to be just peachy when we have Jesus. But it's not always that way, is it? Romans 14, verse 17 says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. That is, it's not a matter of physical so much as righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's right living before God and other people. That's peace with God and others. And that's joy in the Lord because you know you have hope. We weren't, you know, we aren't the only ones that missed the kingdom. The Pharisees, they asked Jesus about it all the time. They asked him when it would come in Luke 17, and he said, Hey, you won't be able to see the kingdom of God, not by visible signs. You won't be able to say, Here it is, or it's over there, or anything like that. But rather, the kingdom of God is already among you. The kingdom of God is within you. That's the key right there. 
See, there's this strange ten tension in the Bible of a now and not yet sort of kingdom. Because we, the church, are the deposit of God's future and coming kingdom. We are the inbreaking of God's kingdom on earth. It started when He pours out His Holy Spirit upon the believers in Pentecost. And it continues this day. We all just sat here and prayed, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We are followers of the King, so therefore we have a job. Thy will be done on earth. Do you think the world's going to do His will? It's up to us. He's empowered us with the Holy Spirit to begin to show the world, hey, this is what the kingdom will be like. This is what the kingdom will be like. We're to be about the business of our king and bring in, and bring in this peaceful king, kingdom that Isaiah talks about in verses 6 to 9. Now, he uses all sorts of poetic imagery, imagery that they would get to describe it. He says things like, the wolf and the lamb live together. Well, these people are shepherds. They knew wolves were predators and that sheep were prey. But see, in the kingdom, the natural order of things is mixed up. The strong are not to prey on the weak. So we as a church, that means we stand up against injustice. When there are those who have no voice and they are being wronged, we have to be their voice. You can think of many ways. Probably one of the most famous today is child trafficking. It's a horrible thing going on. We have to be the voice for those people. Unborn children, they're wronged or abused, or killed. We have to be the voice. Isaiah continues, he says, the bear and the calf feed together. And those are two completely different animals. So, but it's obvious that some, something has gone on, some sort of reconciliation or forgiveness because their young are playing together, they're teaching their children, their, their young are all right with it. See, those of us in the kingdom are to lead the way in forgiveness. And I could talk all day on forgiveness, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to give a quick definition that you use in life. This is what forgiveness looks like, okay? First of all, let's get the wrong, wrong vision out of the way. People say, forgive and forget. It's not really in the Bible. Forgive and forget. You can't do that. I mean, you can't always forget when people have wronged you, can you? Can you forget that? No, you can't. But you can forgive. And forgiveness is where you submit. You give up any right that you have to throw it in their face in an argument. You give up any right that you have to slip in those little remarks that will make them pack their bags and go on a guilt trip. You know what I mean. You give up any right you have to talk about that person behind their back. You lay it down and say, Lord, with your help, because I can't do it, I'm not going to pick it up anymore. That's a working model of forgiveness in your life. Isaiah is not done. He says something about like a child, reaching into the hole of a snake. It's an image of, you know, kids getting into things. And when kids get into things, because they do, I mean, I did when I was a kid, and I'm pretty sure you did too. What do you as a parent feel? Fear. Don't you ever worry about your kids and be afraid? I know you all do. So this is a kingdom without fear. 1 John 4.18 says, love conquers fear. Here's one way to take love into the world during the holidays. 
Now, the holidays is festive season, right? Everybody's all happy. But during the holidays, Thanksgiving to Christmas, there's more suicides than any other time of the year. There's a lot of people for whom the holidays are not a happy time, right? Sometimes bad things have happened. There's bad memories. Sometimes they're depressed because everybody else is happy. Look around. Be open to that. And the Spirit will lead you. And then here's how you act. You pray with them, not for them. Because when we say, hey, I'll pray for you, that also means I got to go now. And if I remember tonight or tomorrow morning or sometime this week, I'll mention you to God. But if you ask that person, can I pray with you? And go to the throne of the Almighty together. Because that's what prayer is. It's just conversation with God. Wow. Normally, they won't turn you down. And then you know what? You don't have to influence them in any way because you're talking about God doing it. Isn't that, isn't that what he does? You're just letting him being the vehicle. See, this same Spirit of God now rests upon you, each and every one of us, the Holy Spirit. So we are to go and do, to be the hands and feet of Christ now in our lives, with our families, with our friends, at work, everywhere. Let's pray. Lord God, We humbly ask that uh, you forgive us for shortcomings and oversights in a busy, festive season where we move at a pace that is just almost inhuman. Lord, we ask in this moment as we have slowed down and, and we are waiting upon you. We ask that you pour out your grace upon each and every one of us. Lord, Give us eyes to see those people who are hurting. Let us see them as you see them, made in the image and likeness of God. And that we need to bring them before your throne. Let us be your agents of forgiveness. Give us strength to do this. Lord, prick our hearts when we see injustice and spur us into action. We ask all this in your name. Amen.